Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Note Closure Show. As always, Scott Carson, excited to be here with you today. And we've got a very special guest join us uh, from north of the border who uh, knows a thing or two about working with investors and really knocking some things out. Our, our good buddy Dave DeVos has joined us. He, and for those that don't know who Dave is, he's a real estate entrepreneur up in Canada who learned the hard way that the old saying, just find a good deal and the money will find you is horse hooey. <laughs> I love that. After losing on a great deal due to lack of investors and capital, Dave discovered a clever way to get investors to chase him after him about his deals instead of the other way around. So we're excited to hear about this horse hooey strategy uh, this morning from north of the border, buddy Dave there, buddy. How you doing, Scott? So hopefully... <laughs> <laughs> Sound effects and everything. I didn't know it was a high budget show like that, my friend, I tell you. $10 on some... <laughs> Hey, we make ten dollars go a long way down here. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for having me on the show. Appreciate it. It's a real pleasure. And what I'm going to be sharing with your folks today is uh, how to avoid all the horse hooey of of how most people have heard about raising capital. At least that's my take on it. Most of what we've heard and learned about raising capital, you know, dialing for dollars, turning every conversation into a real estate conversation, <laughs> you know, networking, schmoozing cold calling, spamming everybody we know about our deals. I think that uh, is the exact opposite of what we should actually be doing. And well, well, the reason I know is because I've tried all that stuff <laughs> <laughs> and failed miserably at it. So I, I had to find a different way. Well, that's 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 awesome. Well, you've been investing for a few years. You want to share kind of with our audience before we dive into the, some of those nuggets there, kind of your background yeah. and kind of your focus these days? Yeah, yeah. Well, I actually realized that the other day, um, my first real estate investment was way back when I was 12 years old. My mother was actually a, a, quite a successful real estate entrepreneur in her own right, even though she was a full-time teacher. She was a single mom. She still built up a portfolio of over 50 doors. Wow. Um, so I remember when I was 12, she and my older brother were working on a duplex deal. And I, they're talking about it around the kitchen table all the time. And, and I got excited. And I said, hey, you know, I'd, I'd like to be part of this. So I'd saved up 200 bucks from whatever. And so I, they said, okay, you can invest. And they affectionately said, I got to own the garbage stoop of that property. So that was <laughs> my first foray into real estate. Uh, fast forward, uh, next kind of fooling around with it would have been in the early 2000s. I was actually living down in San Jose, Costa Rica. I spent uh, 10 years living in Mexico and Central America, most of that time in Costa Rica. And I stumbled across a couple of foreclosure deals down there, believe it or not, wow. and uh, did those. Those were quite lucrative. And then my then wife, uh, Susie and myself, we had two little kids. We thought, you know what? Costa Rica is great. But being a pasty faced white guy in Latin America, whether <laughs> you got money or not, people assume you do. And there's a little risk of being kidnapped. Yeah, that'll work which we don't have a big risk of here in Canada. So we decided it'd probably be a better idea if we raised the kids in Canada. So in 2003, we left everything, quite a nice lifestyle, nice, nice business down there, you know, gardeners, maids, all that kind of stuff. And move back to Canada, start all over again from scratch, move the family into a crappy little rental place on the not so good side of town and started all over again. That's when I got into uh, quick turn real estate investing a la Ron Legrand. Yeah. I, I remember seeing one of those infomercials, sent away for it, got the course, had to Canadianize it because, again, that's all American. Pretty similar in Canada, but a few little tweaks here and there. And then did 18 deals in 18 months. That was my initial kind of claim to fame with that. Um, then, but that, that was all low money down, no money down type deals. So I didn't need investors, I didn't even understand the concept of using other people's money. Uh, took a hiatus from that, started working in, in marketing, which is kind of my background. Helped uh, the Canadian rich dad grow his company and, and eventually raise over $200 million for investment projects that way. Jumped back into real estate in 2010, focusing on lease options. Self-financed my first few deals because we were doing tenant first. We'd buy people a, a property, rent own it to them for two or three years and close out on the deal. And uh, like most people, self-financed my first few properties, ran out of cash, ran out of credit. And that's when I thought, well, okay, 
I've, I've heard, you know, just find a good deal and the money will find you. Have you ever heard that one, Scott? Uh, I think I said it yesterday on a webinar, actually. <laughs> that's, that's the one I found out was horse hooey. You know, <laughs> if, yet yeah, that is true, if you've already got a, a group of prospective investors lined up, then yes, that's true. But if you don't, if you're starting with a good deal and then starting from scratch, trying to raise capital under a time crunch, that's what can lead into disaster. So I'd heard, you know, turn, start dialing for dollars. So that's what I, I picked up the phone and I called somebody. No, thanks. Not interested. Called again. No, thanks. No interest. Again, again, again. So in, in total, I did about five cold calls to be perfectly <laughs> frank with you, Scott, but I have a fragile ego. And I, after five hard no's, I pouted and quit cold, cold calling, which I find a lot of people, <laughs> which I find a lot of people kind of, kind of do because not everybody's designed as a, a as a, a closer, right? We see these guys, we see uh, Wall Street, we see, you know, uh, Wolf of Wall Street, we see Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, all the, all these sales type guys. Most people are not that guy. Yeah. You know, they, they can only take so much rejection that they quit. And that, that turned out to be me. So then I heard, hey, you know what? Turn every conversation into a real estate conversation. So I ran out and I was doing networking and all this kind of stuff. Got a bunch of weird looks because I was trying my 30 second elevator pitch on people and all this stuff that you hear you're supposed to do didn't work. Uh, it was running out of time. So I had to get an extension on this deal. Then I came up with a brilliant idea. I said, hey, why don't I email everybody I know with a little deal overview? And I'm, I'm sure I'll shake the tree and raise some money that way. So that, that I did, I, I emailed everybody I knew. I got really excited because I saw all these replies coming back, Scott, until I started reading the replies. And then it was like, you know, the gist of it was, hey, Dave, haven't heard from you in 10 or 15 years, buddy. And the first thing that comes out is you're looking for money for deals. Bugger off. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty much the, the gist of it. So bottom line, I lost that deal. I had to uh, return my clients money to them. They'd already given notice where they're renting to get in. I mean, it was a disaster. I got mm. mud on my face. I pissed everybody off uh, that was involved in that deal. And I vowed right then and there, you know what? I never want to be in that position where I'm desperately scrambling for the cash. I never want to be there again. So that's when I, I, I came up with, I said, why don't I apply marketing to finding investors, raising capital? And I've done it all these different businesses. Why don't we turn things around? Instead of me desperately chasing after people, what if we create some marketing and get them reaching out to me interested in my deals instead of me desperately pushing my deals on them? Does that make sense? That totally makes sense, Dave. And that's that's the smart thing of doing things is, is using the tools that are available to this day and really knocking things out. Because I think everybody struck, struck out, struck out in a multitude of ways, like you said. You know, we all come into the the real estate investing space, like a new puppy, all just excited. And we do a variety of different things. And you can become that annoying person who's asking everybody about real estate. You know, you it can be that. like dating life back in the day, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I've got some buddies I went to college where they use that like, oh, you know, if I ask 20 of them, one of them, I'll, I'd answer 20 girls. So I'm going to be t kissing one of them by the end of the evening. There you go. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, and you know, we've all sent emails out to our database. If you've never done it before, yeah, there's a there's a science to kind of reach out. So, and a lot of people have gotten those ugly hate meals. And so it's the same thing. We're not all, you know, uh, Jordan Belfort we're making phone calls, 100 phone calls in a day. So I, I, I'd love to hear this. Before you dive into it, though, you've got kind of an idea behind what an investor is kind of truly worth, though, to you. Correct? Oh, yeah, no, this, this was a, a major revelation when I kind of dialed this in, Scott. So Chances are, if, if you got entrepreneurial entrepreneurial people listening to this, or they've been in business for themselves, they probably heard of the lifetime worth of a customer or a client, right? Which is figuring out how much a customer is worth to you over the lifetime of your working relationship with that person. So I'd heard of that many, many years ago. I applied that to my business in Costa Rica. I was thrilled at that time when I realized lifetime worth of a, a client for me then was $12,000. I thought, holy crap, that's amazing. That's fantastic. When I applied that same concept to what the lifetime worth of an investor partner was for me doing the rent own deals, it was $120,000 wow. over the life. And that's, that's the profit in my pocket. That's not gross. 
That's not, you know, before doing splits. That is my share of the profits working with an investor partner over the lifetime of our working relationship. All right. So do you think it'd be helpful for people if, if we kind of walked them through that little formula? I'm happy to do that. I think it's a great thing. And people are uh, listening breathlessly out there to this All right. episode. You know, and guys and gals, this is something, if you're listening to it, you may want to stop working out or stop running or pull over on the side of the road. So you, don't... you might want to jot it down. Exactly. Right. So, exactly. Um, so basically what we want to start with, Scott, is we want to start out with what is your average net profit on a deal. Okay. Your average net profit on a deal. Now you got to take it and like everybody's doing different things. So you're, you're focusing on, on notes. So it's a little bit different there, but if you're doing single family homes, if you're doing multifamily, you're doing lease option, you're doing flips, you're doing whatever. Everybody's a little bit different. Every market's different. Every asset class is different. So obviously this is going to take a little bit of thinking, but let's just use the, the rent own thing as an example, because that's where I figured it out. So with my rent home deals, I figured out over a two or three year period, by the time I took all of the profit centers into account, I and paid out my investor partners, I would end up with about $40,000 in profit at the end of the day. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense. Yes, sir. Yeah. So the next thing we want to figure out is how many investors do we need to do a deal, a typical deal? So in my case, my minimum investment was between seventy-five and hundred thousand dollars. So I only wanted to have one investor per deal, which is kind of the the ideal number for me. You know, with smaller deals. Well, it's also the legal side of things here. If you're starting to pull money of, of things, you can get in trouble if you don't have a you know you don't have a, a fund or are not securities licensed. So one investor per one deal is a very very smart aspect. Maybe different north of the border there. But here in the United States and a lot of places that you want, I think it makes it easier too, because you can have too many cooks in the kitchen, right, Dave? It definitely makes it easier. Now, again, you're getting into multifamily properties, that sort of thing, you might need to have more deals. You might need to syndicate things. Yeah. Make sure you stay, make sure you stay legal. That's for sure. Cool. But anyway, so for that case, I needed one investor per deal. Um, so the next thing we want to figure out, so one investor per deal, $40,000 total profit to me. So how many deals can we reasonably expect to do with an investor partner over the lifetime of our working relationship? So I decided, you know what, I want to be conservative. So I'm going to say, even though it's probably a little too conservative, I'm going to say, realistically, let's say an investor will do two deals with me over our working relationship, right? So when I cash them out of one deal, Chances are we did a good job. They'll reinvest that money in the next deal. Or if they're happy with how things are going along, maybe they miraculously come up with another 75 or hundred grand to do another deal at the same time. Does that make sense? Totally One makes investor, sense. two deals. All right. So when I first started this, Scott, I thought, okay, well, one investor doing two deals, if each deal is worth 40 grand to me, that would mean that an investor is worth 80 grand, right? Yeah. But I forgot to take into account uh, if the investor is a happy camper and we encourage it, chances are we can get some referrals out of that, right? So again, being conservative, I thought, okay, well, let's, let's, let's be not too pie in the sky with this. So let's say for every two investors I get on board, I get one referral. Is that pretty conservative? Is that yeah, I think it's really conservative. Yeah, I think you should be able to get at least a half a referral per person or at least one. Yeah. Well, there you go. So it became the equivalent of one and a half investors, right? So I've got my average profit per deal, $40,000 multiplied by one investor per deal. So it stays at $40,000 multiplied by two deals that that investor will do with me over the lifetime. So that brings it up to $80,000, right? And then we got the referral factor. So we got to add on another 50%. So multiplied by 1.5. That's as hard as the math gets, I guess. So that's what brought it up to $120,000 for me. So what I encourage your folks to do out there is to do the exact same thing. Figure out what the average net profit is to you on a deal. And take it, if you're doing long-term buy and hold, I'd say look at a, a 10 year time frame. So if you're doing a deal where you're holding onto it for long-term, Let's use, look at a 10 year time frame and make sure you remember all the different profit centers of your particular strategy. So 
So again, depending on how you count them, there could be seven or eight. So you got instant equity if you're getting a deal on the property, right? You go in, you make a good deal. You're getting forced depreciation if you're fixing it up and, and making it prettier and more valuable. You're getting cash flow. Cash flow is king, right? You're getting mortgage pay down if you're doing it that way over time. You're getting natural market appreciation. You're also getting the, the benefits of leverage using the bank's money if you're doing that way. And you're getting depreciation if you're using that with long-term strategies as well. That's Those are the ones that come to me off the top of my head. I might be missing one or two, but that should cover most of it. Yep, that's good. All right. Does that make sense, Scott? It's kind of hard to explain it just verbally. I usually... No, it, that totally makes sense. If you're doing two deals, if you figure you're going to have one investor that's going to at least do two deals with you, you're making 40 grand per deal as your, as your net profit, you know, and then you expect to at least get you know, one re referral from every at least two investors out there. So yeah, the numbers make sense. Simple math. We see how you come up with $120,000 value of to you per investor. Um, with notes, it might be a little bit less because we're talking 12 to 24 month time frames to take either take the you know keep his performance sell it off or vice versa back. But still very very feasible to make things happen. And the more often you do it, I think I think maybe your referrals might be a little lower. But that's okay because not you know some people like to hoard where they're getting good returns versus sharing it with everybody, right? Exactly. But here, so here's the other thing, Scott. Though, so what I found is typically for for deals that are a much shorter time frame, like notes, you're getting a higher turnover investor, so they're doing much a lot more deals with you. So what I usually say is, for for long term type deals, use two deals per investor. But if you're doing flips or perhaps even with notes, you could be looking at four to six deals per investor partner, which, I mean, I'm sure you've seen that many, many times. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great number. You just got to calculate what's going on, your velocity of capital, average time frame, definitely. So that's that's good stuff there. So that's that's awesome. I love that. People, uh, hopefully that was a nugget you wrote down there for you. Once again, nugget for you. I love that. I think it's a great thing. Everybody can take the, that into account. It's about doing the deals though, when it comes down to, right? It, exactly. It's make it be worth that, but if you never... Or getting making any offers or making any deals happen or getting deals funded or having investors show up at your door hey spend my money for me buddy <laughs> or invest it <laughs> exactly well, that's what i mean let's put it to work uh what's your formula for that or what's what's kind of your philosophy on on getting the investors to chase you versus you chasing the money all right so i you know i like to think have, have you ever heard the term that a a Smart person learns from their own mistakes. A wise person learns from the mistakes of others. Yeah. So I, I was smart. I learned from my own mistake. That that was a, I mean, I still vividly remember that experience. It sucked. I mean, I'm sure you've been through something similar, maybe not the same situation, but losing a deal like that and getting mud on your face, that's a, a, a good slap to wake you up and kind of shake things up. So I said, okay, that didn't work. That sucked. Let's do something different. So through trial and error and just kind of applying 20 some years of, of marketing background and experience and, and, you know, lots of experience in different fields, I said, okay, how do, how do we apply this to finding investors raising capital? So that's where I came up with this five-step process, which, you know, obviously we can't go in super in depth in this call, but we can do a, a 30,000 foot overview if you'd like, Scott. Does that sound perfect. good? Yeah, perfect. So the first thing we want to do is we want to focus on a group of people that we have. We want to create a, a target group of prospective investors, a target group of prospective investors. And the magic number I found for, for my clients is shooting for about 200 of them. Okay. So where do we start? Well, I know things are a little bit different south of the border, but I'm pretty similar. So we, you guys have got the, uh, Securities and Trade Commission. We've we've got provincial securities commissions here. Bottom line, they're all nasty, yeah. and they want to protect Joe Public from getting ripped off by evil real estate investors and con <laughs> artists. Right? That's that's what they're out there for. So we got to stay compliant with them. So up up north here in Canada, we've got this kind of exemption. We can raise capital. We can bring on friends, family and close business associates as investor partners uh, in our deals, all right? And I believe that's something similar down in the state. So that's where we want to start. And bottom line, what I found, Scott, is for anybody to invest with, they need to know you, like you, and trust you, right? 
So it's actually a shortcut when we start with this group because we got two out of three taken care of. So just like the meatloaf song, two out of three ain't bad, right? So <laughs> we got a group of people that already know us, theoretically already like us. Now what we just really need to work on is the trust factor with these people. So we come up with that group of about 200 people and everybody says, well, Dave, that, that sounds pretty tough to come up with a group of 200 people that you have a pre-existing relationship with. And yes, it does sound a little bit tough. So what I suggest, Scott, is that people start with a much bigger group and whittle it down quickly. So when I was first doing this, I thought, well, I'll try this. I pulled out the old cell phone and I exported all of my contacts from the cell phone. And I found out that I had over 900 contacts mm. on my cell phone. Okay then dump in all the contacts from your email address, your email accounts, dump in your contacts from your Facebook, your LinkedIn, get this big group, you know, and then quickly go through it and then just delete anybody that you see on that list that a name, that a face doesn't pop into your mind, right? That's the shortcut. So instead of coming up with 200, start with a thousand or 2000 and whittle it down to 200. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense because if you don't know them, it's not about who knows you. It's about, I mean, it's not about who you know, but who knows you. So if you don't know them, they sure as heck don't know you, right? Exactly, right? And we want to stay compliant as well. Yep. So that's the first job. We come up with that list and then we avoid doing what I did, which was spamming everybody, right? So what I developed, Scott, is what I call a warm-up can campaign or a reconnection campaign. It's a little simple little three-step campaign. First step is you send out a little email kind of catching people up on what you've been up to for the last three, four, five years. So I call this the Christmas letter from Aunt Nadine. And you, <laughs> you're, you're a young guy, so you probably don't remember this stuff, but way back in the day before the interweb existed and Bookface was around and everybody was connected with all this stuff, people used to actually write letters. I know, it sounds crazy. They put stamps on envelopes and they sent this stuff out. So my Aunt Nadine was amazing at this. She had you know, five kids and a gazillion relatives. So she was very efficient. She would take, she would write one letter at Christmas time, four or five pages, catching everybody up on what she and the family had been doing. She would photocopy that letter and send it out to everybody in their Christmas cards. And that was back in the day before you were, you know, long distance was super expensive. So you weren't just picking up the phone, talking to people. You know, this was how people communicated. And every year we get this Christmas, Christmas letter from Matt Nadine. And it was kind of cool we got caught up caught up on her and all the family in one fell swoop. Does that make sense? So totally we want a modern, modern day version of that. So it's just a little bit, not too, too long, but a little bit about what you're up to professionally, what you're up to with the family. You know, if you got kids, how old they are, what grade they're in, what they're into, your spouse, your significant other, you know, talk a little bit about the, talk about the good stuff, talk a little bit about the not so good stuff as well, because we've all had shit happen in our lives, right? You know, deaths, divorces, moving, whatever. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Just don't dwell on it. But we want this to be a genuine communication, right? A real communication, not just one of these Facebook posts where everybody's lives are amazing, right? It's, yeah. it's real. Yeah. Catch them up on what you've been doing a little bit about work. Don't get into real estate too much. You know, if you're a full-time real estate person, great. Talk a little bit about it. But we're not trying to pitch anybody yet. This is legitimate reconnection, trips you've taken, hobbies you've got, sports you play, whatever, right? And then at the end of it, very, very important, say, well, that's what I've been up to. How about you? How, have you, how are you doing? Please click reply to this email and let's catch up. You send that out to all 200 people on your list. You can do that through an email autoresponder, you know, something like GetResponse or MailChimp or something like that. So you just do it once and it goes out to everybody kind of thing. And then people are going to start replying and make sure you have a genuine reconnection with the people that reply. All right. So that's step number one. Step number two, three or four days after that, you do the same thing, but instead of sending out a plain text email, you do a little video version of what you just did. All right. So again, video is awesome. It's the next best thing to being there with somebody in person. You know, everybody's freaked out about video, but I mean, just think about this. Imagine if you got a video from a long lost friend, somebody you haven't seen for 10 or 15 years. And all of a sudden there they popped up on your screen and they caught you up on what they've been up to for the last four or five years. How cool would that be? It's awesome. And that's how your friends are going to feel. Your contacts are going to feel as well. Bang, send that out again. Hey, that's what I've been up to. Love to hear how you're doing. Please hit reply to this email. Let's catch up. 
that one gets a lot of response, okay? And then the last email, Scott, is all about giving them the heads up or what I call the transition message. Another short video, probably about a minute long, basically saying, hey, it's Dave. It's been really good reconnecting with you over the last week or so. I want to let you know that moving ahead, I plan on doing a better job of staying in touch and letting you know what I'm up to with real estate. Real estate is something I'm really excited about. I'm doing really well with it. In fact, I think real estate investing done the right way is the best way for everyday people like us to get a really good solid return on our money backed by something solid, real property. You know what? And who knows, maybe sometime in the future, you might even want to partner up with me and share in the profits on a deal. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge, right? Yeah. But if you're not interested in real estate, that's okay too. You can always click on the unsubscribe button at the bottom of any of my emails. You'll be taken off my list immediately. No hard feelings. In the meantime, <clears throat> if you haven't had a chance to get back to me and let me know how you're doing, please hit reply. I'd love to catch up. Take care. God bless. Talk to you soon. Send that one up. That one's magic, right? Because it gives people a heads up that you're going to switch gears and you're going to do a better job of staying in touch and you're going to start talking real estate. Does that make sense, Scott? Totally makes sense. and I love it. And if you're using MailChimp or something like that, you're able to see who's clicking on your emails, who's opening the emails and seeing if they actually responded to you or they unsubscribed or they're waiting for a response from you, you know? Now, the interesting thing is when I talk to, like, you're, you've been doing marketing and email stuff forever, so you know the answer to this. But most people, <laughs> when I ask them at a, a live event, they say, how many people do you think are going to opt out from your list after you send out that third message? I've had people say, as many, quite often I have people say 80 or 90% are going to opt out. No. What, what I found, Scott, is if you've got a list of about 200 people, typically you might have, between all three of those emails, you might have three, four, five, maybe six people opt out of that campaign, okay? So, and you've given the heads up, you've given them fair warning that you're gonna start talking about real estate. And quite often, it's kind of funny, it's not designed for this, but quite often my clients are actually starting to book meetings and consultations just from this process. It's, it happens way more often than I have, about half the time, and they actually start raising capital right from this process. Not designed for that, but it happens more often than I would have thought. Yeah, I would think that would be something that you would see happen quite a bit, because especially with like Calendly and stuff like that, you know, we've been using that with our bank asset managers as we're reaching out and touching base. Hey, if you want to schedule 15 minutes just to catch up, let's let's pick a time that works for both your, your and my schedule and go from there. Because I, I really, I want to focus on that 15 or 30 minutes to catch up. Exactly. And there's, you know, there's a great tool to do that. And plus, once they connect with you, then it's, it's, it's a personal relationship again. You know, uh, it doesn't always say, hey, hey, fund my deal or buy my stuff. You really, you know, 200 people, that's not a big, big list. I mean, most of us have more than that in, in our media aspect. I mean, you said you had about 900 contacts in your phone. I bet you can only remember four or five phone numbers, though, if that's the best, right? Well, I can't, I can't, I can't, don't even, I can barely remember mine for crying out loud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. So that it, it works very, very well. Um, yeah. So then the next step is to make sure you've got something to show somebody if they show interest, right? So that's what we work with with our clients. We put together what I call a million dollar investor presentation. Mm. And, you know, I've, I've heard, you know, especially the salesy kind of guys say, you know what, you should be able to explain your deal on the back of a napkin or on a legal pad or the Sharpie pen and all that kind of stuff. Um, I find very, very few people can do that well consistently. So what I found works best for most people, Scott, is to create a, a short slideshow presentation, like a PowerPoint or a keynote, something like that, something to take people through. It's a lot more visually interesting for the other person. <laughs> and for my benefit, especially the older I get, the grayer I get, the more it keeps me on track. <laughs> because uh, I don't forget any of the important points. I don't forget any of the important questions I need to ask people. I don't go too far off on tangents. It keeps me focused. So I find that works really, really well. Because when you start having people reach out to you, you know, you can meet with them at Starbucks or you can just do like we're doing right now, buddy, and jump on Zoom, share your screen, show them your presentation. Doesn't matter if you're in Austin, Texas, and I'm in Kamloops, British Columbia. We can, we can still go through the presentation. So it works really, really well. Now, how long do you see the presentation need to be? We're not talking like 50 slides. We're probably talking something 
pretty. Well, actually, I, I actually do have about 45 slides, but here's the important part. A lot of them are very, very, there's some repetition in there and it's very, very fast. So, so for example, some of these slides, literally you're going through it in uh, less than 10 seconds. Right. So the whole presentation I'm shooting for, you know, with, with questions and back and forth, I'm shooting for 25 minutes ish. That's, that's what I'm shooting for. Yeah. That's smart. Smart. Cause then you leaves plenty of time there for Q and A. Somebody's got a 30 minute time slot or they've got, you know, 45 minutes, got to go somewhere. That's a smart, that's a smart thing. The last thing you want to do is be in a two hour presentation for a timeshare. You know what I mean? Exactly. Exactly. Right. So that's, that's really important. So you make sure that you've got your presentation ready, got it ready to go. Uh, you've practiced it a few times. One of the tricks that uh, we like to do is we like to set our clients up with uh, several practice runs with actual people in the first place, uh, which quite often lead to actually raising capital as well. But you, you go in as if it's a practice run and then you kick in your marketing or what I call the three C's, constant, consistent communication, right? Mm -hmm. Hang on a second. Hang on. What were those three C's again? Slow it down a little bit for those that weren't listening. Three C's. <laughs> Constant, consistent communication. Mm. All right. Now, a lot of people say, well, what's the difference between constant and consistent? Well, constant is more a, a matter of timing. So it's coming out on a regular basis. And Scott, you're a marketer. So you, you, you know, you're familiar with how often you can reach out to people. Most folks, most regular folks are freaked out at the idea of bugging the people on their list. And they're absolutely panic stricken about that. So, to get started with, I always recommend start with one thing, get it going, get it going consistently, shoot for a minimum of once a month to get started with. And that's that's rock bottom minimum. And it can be whatever kind of floats your boat the best, right? So uh, probably because I'm so damn good looking, um, smart, uh, you know, experienced and modest, I prefer video. <laughs> And humble, <laughs> just actually, just kidding. I like I love video just because, like I said before, it's the next best thing to be in there. Plus, I just find it a lot easier than writing. But if you're into writing, I've got uh, clients and students that are just phenomenal at doing blog posts or doing electronic newsletters. That's what really juices them up. Whatever it is that you can do on a consistent basis, start with one thing. Um, what Dean, Dean Jackson calls your flagship communication. That one thing that you can do consistently. All right, get that up and going. Then if you want to add more stuff, do that. And Scott, I'm, I, I know you're a big fan of this, but it's, it's all about education and entertainment, right? Mm -hmm. And you want to be a little bit light on the education side, quite frankly, when it comes to raising capital, because most of the people that are on your prospective investor list are not real estate weirdos like us. Okay, you know, here we are. We got podcasts. We're doing this. We're 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 seeped in this. This is our thing. We're we think we make the mistake and think that the average human being is into real estate like this, and they aren't. They they. But what they want to know is they want to know that we know our stuff. Yeah. Right. So what I found has worked the best, uh, Scott, is is a combination of a little bit of education, Reader's <laughs> Digest level, very very high level, and then entertaining. Right. Try to be a little bit entertaining there. It's that. So have something coming out on a regular basis. Start with once a month, work it up to twice a month, then get it up to once a week is is kind of the ideal thing I've found works best for people. Yeah, I would agree 100 percent wholeheartedly with those numbers. I mean, some people are like, what the heck am I going to talk about? And the thing you got to keep in mind is you'll think of things. I mean, the same questions you have are often the same questions people have or as people ask you questions, make a note of those, because I guarantee if one person is thinking it, others are thinking it as well. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it, well, the best success we see with our students are people that are sending an email out usually every Sunday night, they're following up or they're doing some bit of video, whether it's a separate topic or they're just simply doing a recap of the video so somebody can watch the video in two minutes or three minutes versus reading it because everybody learns differently. Some people like to listen, some people like to watch, and some people like to read. Yeah, exactly. Very, very well said. Uh, video logs are one of the, the most popular things, or one of the things that w tends to work the best for, for folks. And then coming up with, yeah, coming up with content isn't as tough as it might seem uh, at the beginning. What I suggest is that you do it in batches mm -hmm. and, and a good shortcut is to focus on 
you know, so for example, one thing we do is why real estate, right? So we compare and contrast real estate investing to everything else out there, bash the hell out of stocks, bonds, mutual funds, GICs, all that crap, and just, you know, show why real estate is the thing to, to invest in. Another thing you might take a look at are top 10, you know, David Letterman style stuff, right? So top 10 reasons for investing in notes, right? I'm sure you can come up with 10, 20 reasons why notes rock and everything else sucks. That's what you focus on, right? You could talk about uh, profit centers of real estate investing, you know, depending on how you count them, there's seven or eight right there. Well, there you got seven or eight pieces of information, right? So it's, it's just a matter of brainstorming a bit. Yeah, I, I I like to take a look at the calendar because the calendar will provide you so much stuff. Because if you if you're gonna get to like the once a week thing, I think the mistake that our aunts made early on was only sending that one freaking five page letter around Christmas time. You know, I well, think pay for stamps, buddy. I know. Well, you have to. It's true, exactly. <laughs> but I I think if you look at the calendar, every month has a major holiday, which is a very simple. Hey, just want to take the time to wish you and your family a happy Fourth of July or happy Labor Day. You know. And then also to people, you know, different things like, hey, you like the best of, you know, the top 10 list or top three reasons, stuff like that. I'm a big proponent of a case study or networking yeah. event. Hey, you know, here's an event that I'm going to this month, whether it's the local meetup group that you're going to or a real estate club or going to a conference or expo or attending something is always great stuff. Because I think people are attracted to people doing something. Mm. You know what Very I mean? Well yeah. yeah. And then also deal walkthroughs are awesome. Yes. Oh, yes. Those, that's, that's the best because then... There's the proof in the pudding. Here I am at the property, cleaning up cat crap or whatever the hell I'm doing, right? It doesn't really matter, but you're there, you're doing your thing. You're proving that you're an active real estate entrepreneur. So yeah. As Ron Legrand used to say, the smell of shit and piss turns him on. It's the smell of money to him, you know? <laughs> Ron's a different kind of guy, but <laughs> he is a different kind of guy. Ron, I, and I, I had the good fortune to travel as a vendor on, at, at a lot of Ron's events from 2004 to 2008. So I know, uh, Ron very well. Yeah, I, I got to spend a little bit of time with him. He's a he's a cranky older guy, the old auto mechanic in him. And if you had Snickers, you were his friend. If you didn't have Snickers, he didn't like you that much. But <laughs> Costco <laughs> buying Snickers. Yeah, well, I um I was part of. I met Ron through Dan Kennedy. I was yeah. part of the whole Kennedy gang for many years. So yeah, 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 yeah. Good guy. Yeah. So talking about you know case studies, whether it's before or maybe after photos or previous yeah. case studies. And this is the thing, people come in, well, I don't have, you know, I haven't proven concept that the, the people are going to ask me, tell me about the deals that you've done. I'm like, well, if you, you haven't started with any deals, what would be your suggestion for somebody who's brand new, hasn't done a deal or two, Dave? Borrow a deal. Okay. Hang on a second. You heard that here. Borrow a deal, everybody. And, and I've had many people call me and ask me about this. And I'm like, just use somebody else's deal. Yeah, yeah. Now, don't bullshit people and tell them that it's your deal. You, you don't want to do that. You want to say, this is the kind of deal that we're looking at, right? Mm -hmm. This this is the kind of deals that we're going to be doing. And then just explain it, right? That's That works very, very well. So that's, it doesn't need to stop you. You know, go hook up with somebody who's doing the kind of deals you want to be doing. Work for free for a little while and film yourself as you're working for free, right? Uh, maybe, you know, for people that are starting right from scratch, do that. Work for free. Um, maybe work for a tiny little piece of equity in the deal. And then you can show that as if it is your deal. This is a deal I'm involved in legitimately, right? So that's one way that you can actually, you know, have some legitimate deals to show for yourself as well. Yeah, that's the thing. And some people are, well, how do I find those? Go to your local real estate investment club. Go talk to people. Hey, who's, who needs an extra back or, or hands to do demo day or to clean out the hoarder's house? You know, uh, yeah, you exactly. find a hoarder's house. I was reading on USA Today. There's like hoarders found a dead body rolled up in a rug. We found a grandmother in the underneath the bed that's been there for three years. Even some guy was misplaced for 10 years, fell behind the cooler and died. So <laughs> yeah, people always need help cleaning up that kind of, you know, so if you volunteer to help for that, <laughs> you deserve a piece of that deal. <laughs> Well, but there's things like mowing lawns or just taking oh, out yeah. the trash. I mean, there's, or well, even whatever, whatever your, whatever your, uh, your strength is. So, I mean, if you're good with numbers, you're going to, you know, help the guy or the gal with their bookkeeping or, you know, whatever it is that you can contribute to the best, just don't go try to pick people, pick people's brains and, and try to get all this information and, and stuff for free. 
legitimate offer to help out whatever it is that, that they need help with and uh, do it with a, with, with a good attitude and be Johnny on the spot. Yeah. Don't be an asshole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's the thing is sharing that stuff is still doing that's taking action. I mean, let's face it, you know, 90% of people don't do anything. You know, you have a lot of people that go to investment clubs just to, to scratch their itch and are scared to take that step. And the things you're talking about, especially if nobody sent an email out or done a video, you know, there's a lot of BS excuses that we tell ourselves not to do that. But if you do that little extra 5%, you're going to stand out from the crowd and people are going to either a surround you want to work with you or invest with you. Right, Dave? Well, bottom line, Scott, you've lived this uh... And, and you know so many successful people. If, if you want to get extraordinary results, you have to do extraordinary things, right? You have to do things out of the ordinary. So yeah, if you want to, uh, if you're worried about what people are going to say about you, what people are, how they're going to respond, what they're going to do, then you're going to stay stuck because you're going to do nothing. So I mean, if you're, if you're wanting to use other people's money to grow your portfolio, to create whatever that real estate dream lifestyle is, you have to do something that you're not used to doing. You have to do something different. Doing what you've, you've been doing has got you where you are. You want to get somewhere else. So you got to do different things. And this is, yeah. Is, is there the risk that somebody might reply and have a snarky remark once in a while? Yeah. It happens very, very rarely. Actually, everybody all, I mean, I've, I've done this with hundreds and hundreds of people very, very rarely do they get a, a snarky remark. They do have a few people opt out. So what? Th those people wouldn't have invested with you anyhow. You, they're doing both of you a favor, right? So just don't worry about it. Thicken up the skin a little bit and realize <laughs> that quite frankly, most people are not thinking about you that much. <laughs> they, they got their own lives. They're doing their own thing. If they get an email from you once a week, they don't, you know, First of all, most of them aren't going to open it. That's just the reality. If you're sending out 200, you know, you're going to be, you know, at the beginning, you'll be doing really well. You'll probably be getting 50, 60, 70 of them, uh, percent of them opening it up. Over time, it'll shrink. That's, that's, just, that's just the way it goes, right? So don't think about it. Don't worry about it too much. People can always self-select, opt themselves out if they don't want to hear from you. Don't get your knickers in a knot about that kind of stuff. Is there a, a point or a transition in your presentation, the video that you would recommend to people about the hook or the ask? Because it's great to give a presentation, but I still think you've got to get to that point where you're, you've got an ask or the, you know, hooked a request if they want to get more information or invest with you. Any expertise that you'd like oh, to you take from our listeners about log? that? The video logs, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, the video logs, every single one of them has an ask. Every, every piece of marketing you set out there, as an ask, people say, well, Dave, how do you get people to, to call you about your deals? So I, say, I tell them to. <laughs> so the end of the video is, hey, you know what? That's one of the profit centers. There's six others. If you'd like to find out how you can benefit from these profit centers as well without having to swing a hammer or deal with tenants and toilets, give me a call. 250-374-2897. Let's have a chat, see if it makes sense for you. Same, you know, pretty much the same call to action at the end of every single message, right? Give me a call. Hit the contact us tab on the website. Book an appointment on my calendar. Whatever it is, whatever you want them to do, tell them to do it and they'll start doing it. Amen to that. Because that's the thing. And a lot of people are, are I don't want to, I don't, I'm tired of asking for money. I'm like, well, you don't ask for money. You got to actually have to ask for it. It's like giving the best presentation. But if you never give them an ask for them to sign up or to contact you, you just kind of wasted your time, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, and, and there's nothing wrong with giving content every once in a while, but you still have to, your time is valuable. And that time, that 30 seconds or that one minute where you've got the slide or the pot spot in your video is the most important aspect of it. You've, 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 you've gotten permission. If they're hanging around to the end, you've gotten from permission to ask them something. If they've gone through an opted in or and they're watching that video or that webinar that you're doing or, or whatever it might be. Uh, you know, like you said, very few people opt out. Some people, you, the snarky people, you don't want to invest with them. You're glad that they're snarky, so you can unsubscribe them manually yep. and go from there, right, Dave? Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. So that's what it's all about. And it's it's this constant, consistent communication. That's the thing, Scott. So what, <laughs> what took me a long time to figure out is that just because I'm keen for somebody to invest with me, 
doesn't mean that they're ready to invest with me, right? So out of that group of 200 people, first of all, we don't know who's got the money and who doesn't have the money ahead of time. And what I found is quite often the, the people that I assume have the money are all flash and no cash. And the folks that have the money, you would never suspect it, mm -hmm. right? They've got it socked away. They've lived very, very frugally, whatever. And then poof out of the woodwork, here comes, you know, Aunt Myrtle with, you know, 250 grand that you didn't, you know, how, they, you know, how did that happen? But it, it happens, right? So you have to have, the, that's the importance of that constant, consistent communication. Because yes, there will be some people in your group that are ready to rock and roll sooner rather than later. There are going to be other people that it's going to take some time for them to warm up to the idea, for them to really start believing that you know what the heck you're doing, for them to create, for, for you to create that trust factor with them about your deal. So this is the biggest mistake I see people making all the time, Scott, when it comes to raising capital, is they got a deal on the go, they hit it hard, it's all about this deal, they, they splash it all over the place, and then it's crickets after that, right? You don't hear anything until the next deal comes around. Then they ramp it all up again and dink, 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 dink. No, that's the wrong thing to do. What you want to do, the chicken and the egg scenario, right? What do you want to have, the, the deal or the money first? You want, in my opinion, you want to have the money lined up first, and then you can go find the deals with complete confidence, right? Because if you know you got the cash taken care of, then you can go negotiate harder. You can, you can go in and, and make offers with fewer subjects in them, right? You can, you can take much bigger, more massive action faster than if you're worried about, if you're tentative about it because you're not sure if the money's gonna come through. Does that make sense? It, it totally yeah. makes sense. And that's, you're 100% right about the whole, hey, we're gonna splash it everywhere and then we don't share anything till the next month or two months goes by. You can't do that because people will see straight through that. You've gotta be able, you really may have to become an expertise or niche expert yeah, and, and share that stuff with them on daily. You know, like you said, the good, the bad, the ugly. What do you do? What, the, uh, what's going on this week? You know what I mean? Those kind of things. Yeah, well, that, that takes us to the, to the next point, right? Which is, is all about being uh, demonstrating your expertise and your authority. And that's, that's exactly what we're talking about, right? So showing them that you're actively doing what you say you're doing, sharing your deals, uh, maybe even sharing some of the, the not so great side of things, right? But showing that you're don't just talk about the problem. Talk about how you're overcoming the problem, right? Because that's in the back of somebody's head. They're thinking, well, okay, why would I want to invest with Scott? Why would I want to invest with Dave? Okay, well, they're coming up with a problem and they've got a solution because most people understand that shit's going to happen, right? Stuff's going to happen. There's, there's not everything's rosy 24-7, right? So right. if you can know how you overcome these challenges, that goes a long way. And the other thing is, and I might have been our mutual buddy, Ron, that said this first, but time and circumstances change people's minds. So just because somebody's not ready to invest with you right now, doesn't mean they won't be six months, 12 down, months down the road. So if you keep in front of them, if you keep up that constant, consistent communication, then the next time they get that mutual fund statement and see how much money they're not making. And they, you know, it's just that final, the hell with this, I, I'm, I'm not doing this anymore. What else can I do with my money? Who's gonna pop into the mind? that guy or that gal that's been constantly and consistently communicating with them about how great real estate is and how they should get involved. And here's a way to do it hands-free, no sweat, because Scott does all the work. Does that make sense? Exactly right. Whether it's their statement or they've been laid off and they got to roll their 401k into something and they want to put it into something that's going to help them out. There's a whole variety of reasons. I mean, that's what we see a lot of times is when people opt into our website it's a three to six month time frame before they a either make a buying or funding decision. And so it's a, it's kind of like, it's almost like the old days of you got to court somebody. It might be three day, three months before you get a kiss. You know what I mean? <laughs> Nobody's going to jump Unfortunately, in. Unfortunately, I do. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> but that's exactly right. Courting. That's a perfect analogy there, right? It's, it's taking your time. It's not rushing. It's not trying to get in the sack right away, right? It's, it's that gradual progression, uh, you know, especially for people with their money. Like I say, some of them are going to be ready to go. Others are going to want to see that you're, you're not just a flash in the pan. A lot of people are, here's, I don't know if you, 
you're you've seen this very much, Scott. But uh, some people are really concerned about this because they, well, you know what, Dave? I tried my hand at another business opportunity in the past of the networky variety, and got all excited about it, and told everybody I knew, and and had home parties, and you know I didn't quite make my millions and got a few people signed up and none of them quite made their millions either. So I might've shot myself in the foot. Well, no, you haven't. First of all, you're not alone. I can't remember the stats, but I think it's like 95 plus percent of everybody who's been in one of those opportunities, yours truly included, bombed at it. Right? So that's- I drew a lot of circles. Okay. I drew in a lot of circles. I was a, di- I was a double diamond Eagle uh, regional manager. <laughs> Yeah, so you were kicking butt and still. No, I wasn't. It was all this compared. That's what I wanted to be. I wasn't kicking butt. (laughs) (laughs) You weren't making any money, but it sounded good, right? (laughs) You got badges and pins and whatnot. So don't worry about it if if that's the case. And and if you take it and run at people, you know, it's okay. Just just be upfront about it. That might be something I would cover in that whole warm up uh, thing as well. Is it's just kind of be upfront about it. Don't, don't try and hide it. Don't try and pretend it never happened. Just say, hey, that didn't work out and I found something so much better. And here's why. You know, That could be a whole thing, right? Why real estate is so much better than multi-level marketing, right? For example, you can come up with a gazillion reasons why right there. So don't let anything like that stop you. I, I love it. I love it, Dave. So many people out there, I'm getting thumbs up and people like it on our Facebook live out there. Amen. So I've drawn a, few, drawn a few circles as well, people are saying out there. But, <laughs> we all have. We've all drawn the circles, that's for sure. Exactly. Now, one of the things that you are, you, you've got an amazing podcast out there. It's doing really great. I was honored to be a guest on it uh, last week. Yes, true. Yeah. yeah and, and you're seeing, I mean, that's, that's your way of kind of being consistent and adding credibility to your stuff on a regular basis, right, Dave? Oh, there's lots of things. Yeah. So again, that's that's one of the things, being, demonstrating expertise and authority. Uh, a great way to do that is to have your podcast. I mean, Scott, you're you're seen as the, the note guy. You've got podcasts, you do Facebook lives, you do all this great stuff. Uh, you don't have to get that carried away. You don't have to even start your own podcast. But being interviewed on podcasts is a fantastic way to boost up your credibility and then make sure that you let everybody you know know about your interview, right? So you push that out as well. So that that kind of thing, uh, speaking at your local real estate investment club meeting, volunteering, you don't even have to speak necessarily, although that's ideal, but just being part of the team that's putting it on, that's huge. Because then you get up, even if you're introducing speakers, even if you're helping people get registered, just get it, get it so people are seeing that you're active in this. Uh, probably the one of the best ways to be seen as an authority is to be an author. That's that's why I got a, seven or eight books behind me. Not because I, I'm particularly gifted as an author. Not partic- because I particularly like writing. It's just it's a fantastic way to be seen as a credible authority. And there's all sorts of different ways things that you can get out on the news. Uh, you know, if you got something timely, you can do press releases. You name it. There's all sorts of ways to create that credibility. Amen to that. Amen to that. Dave, as we're kind of wrapping up time here, what's the best way for people to reach out to you to find more about your five-step formula and find some of your books and, and find out more about what you're doing and how you're helping people uh, with their, uh, you know, raising the capital, avoiding the horse suey and going and finding that the profit. <laughs> well, thanks very much, Scott. I, I, I guess probably the best thing would be to uh, get a copy, an ebook copy of my newest book, The Money Partner Formula which you can get at investorattractionbook.com, investorattractionbook.com, because that's, again, that's my whole goal. My goal for you is instead of you chasing after investors, instead of you desperately chasing after the capital, let's turn that around. Let's get you attracting investors and their money to you so that you can do as many deals as you want, create your ideal real estate portfolio, your ideal net worth and your ideal income through real estate investing. That's what it's all about. Love it. Investorattractionbook.com. We'll have the link in the show notes as well in the video there, in the description of the videos there, there as well for everybody out there interested, investorattractionbook.com. And Dave, thanks for taking so much out of your busy schedule to join us here on the Note Closure Show. Thanks for delivering great content, some really great nuggets on today's show as well. 
Scott, thank you very much for everything that you do, my friend. You're a rock star. Pleasure to get to know you. Look forward to meeting you the next time I'm, I'm in beautiful Austin, Texas. That's right, brother. And hopefully it's not too damn hot and we'll go get some margaritas or something. All right, brother? <laughs> hey, I'm all about margaritas, man. Margaritas, baby. Well, hey, guys. Uh, thanks, Dave. We'll definitely see you there. Guys, go take action. Check out the ebook. Take some of Dave's advice. Or not the advice. Counsel. Because he's helped hundreds and hundreds and th not thousands of investors get over the hump to help them get investors chasing you versus you chasing them. So, Go out, make something happen, everybody, and we'll see you guys all at the top. Bye. See you later.